Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Horasis India meeting. And it's unique circumstances for all of us to be to be meeting in this manner, but 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 we are, and that's most important. Uh, we we don't have a very long session, so I would quickly like to just introduce the topic and move into the discussion and hand over to the panelists. The session today that that we have uh, that we will be discussing on the topic is frugal innovation in post-COVID India. So the COVID pandemic needless to say, has transformed the way we do a number of things, or rather almost everything. It's resulted in significant economic disruption. It's a loss of jobs in India and overseas and abroad. Uh, many have lost their jobs. Many, many small entrepreneurs or small business owners are also facing the brunt of the pandemic. It is something that's impacting lives across the board. Uh, that brings into question what 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 innovation we are seeing in India. India has traditionally been seen as an IT powerhouse. It has also traditionally been seen as a country where innovation takes different forms. And are we seeing that happen today? And given the constraints that the country faces and the economy faces. What sorts of innovation are we seeing? What, you know, how is that impacting business? And how are businesses and individuals responding to the challenges that COVID has posed? So to start with the session, we would, I will just give a quick introduction to the panelists. And each of the panelists will then speak for about a couple of minutes, will introduce themselves. The panelists we have today are Gurvinder Agavalya, founder and chief executive officer of Digital Twin Labs, Noel Appata, chief executive officer Stratex Pro, Klaus Newman, senior vice president for fast growth market strategy at SAP in China, Sukhet Singhal, group chief executive officer Secure Meters in India, and Ray Watch, assistant professor of emerging technology standardization at the Dublin City University which is one of his many hats. Without much ado, I would like to invite the panelists to start leading the discussion. Gurvinder, we'd like to start with you. Just your thoughts on the topic. When you first saw the topic, what is it that, that sprung to mind and a brief introduction on how you perceive this topic? Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Sid, and uh, uh, pleasure and uh, privilege to be here with everybody. And thank you, audience, for joining. Um, I come with a few biases, and this is my interpretation to your question uh, regarding the topic, uh, Sid. <clears throat> when we hear of uh, uh, innovation, innovative, you know, frugal innovation, especially in the context of COVID, post-COVID, uh, they're very, very loaded phenomena, at least three loaded phenomena into, into that title. Uh, so I'm sure collectively we'll try to do a good job in parsing through that. Let me start a little bit with the topic of innovation and then a little bit on the frugality side. Um, and then, of course, uh, in the context of where we are situated now. Um, there are three biases that I come in, three interpretations that I come in uh, when I look at innovation. One is innovation more than anything else is first about people. It's about talent. Yes, it is about resources. It is about capital. It's about a lot of other things, but more than anything else, it's about people, it's about talent, and it's about a certain mindset. Secondly, innovation is really about doing an honest appraisal about yourself. Since we say innovation, since I'm saying innovation is about people, um, it naturally follows it's about doing an honest appraisal about yourself. If we think that things are normal, we are probably not comp we're probably not uh, comparing it in, in, the, in the right baseline and the context. The third, a little bit focusing on the frugality side. Frugality is, of course, the easy interpretation of that is around cost. But I would characterize that more around risk, resources, and, of course, outcomes. Everything is about outcomes and innovation. But, about frugal but frugality is more about risk and resources. 
Um, I'll just leave it at that. There's more to expand in each of those. And just in terms of my introduction, um, I've been, I'd like to say I've been working in innovation for the last couple of decades. Uh, my entire career has been spent in the U.S. I'm originally, of course, um, uh, from India and did my undergrad graduation at St. Stephen's in India and then my advanced education here in the U.S. So I'd like to say I've been working in innovation since I work in technology and those are almost synonyms. But I think the better, char better characterization of that is, you know, Adam Smith's invisible hand of the market is the one that really pulls me into innovation because that's where the, where, that's where the opportunity and the drive is towards societal and business needs. Um, I, 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 uh, absolutely. So just finishing up. So, um, um, I, 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 I'm currently formed as my, as our own company, Digital Twin Labs, uh, delivering solutions largely on blockchain, IoT, and cloud. And previously, I was the chief technology officer for uh, IBM North America, covering um, IoT, cloud, and blockchain. Sorry if I interrupted or went too long. Over to you, Sid. Yeah. Thank you so much, Gurvinder. Uh, Suket, would you like to start? Yeah. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Uh, again, thanks a lot for having me, uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. I think to pick up from what Gurvinder said, look, the most critical thing is the world has changed, uh, but we don't know how it has changed. I, after the Second World War, you know, this scenario doesn't exist in anybody's playbook. We don't have anybody to follow. We don't have anybody to take an example from. Uh, given that the world has changed, each of our businesses needs to change in order to be able to address that new world. And I think this topic is really key because it talks about, you know, at a time of difficulty is the time you should invest in businesses. That's the, you know, how we in India, every time that, uh, whenever the time is bad, we invest in our businesses. But that is um, um, conflicting to conserving cash. How do you conserve cash and invest in your business? And therefore, I think frugal innovation plays a really important part because like Gurbinder said, I don't think frugality is about cheap products. Uh, I don't think Frugality is just about bottom of the pyramid. Frugality is really about delivering outcomes in a severely resource-constrained environment. I think all of us are in a severely resource-constrained environment. We have to try and uh, figure out how we innovate there. Uh, so again, I hope that we're able to do justice to the to the discussion and uh, pass that usage. Thank you. That's that's a very nice way of putting it and defining the topic. Um, Noel, would you like to come in next? Okay, um, thank you very much, um, everyone. Um, COVID-19 has, has brought a lot of challenges to the world as we, as we know it right now. Um, I live in a developing um, society. Um, I, I, I practice my business out of Nigeria. And aside the health challenges that COVID-19 comes with, um, we're also facing the economic challenges the situation has brought. And um, one, one thing about the COVID-19 pandemic that puts about 3 billion people um, indoors for, you know, under lockdown for a long period of time is that it has serious challenges that comes with it. And um, one, of, one of that is because of the, the, the paucity or the lack of business activity um, within that period of time, a lot of people within developed, developing societies especially um, would lack the ability to spend. They would lack the ability to save. They would lack the ability to invest um, because of the economic challenges, because of the fear, most especially the fear that came with COVID-19. Everybody is ignorant on what next to do. The WHO is still vacillating between one, one, one stand and another stand, and nobody's really sure what tomorrow holds. And that brings a lot of economic uncertainty, you know, alongside the health challenges that, that have been faced um, by the world. And, you know, developing nations contribute a lot to the bottom of the pyramid, um, the global bottom of the pyramid, as it were. And with these economic challenges hitting the entire globe, um, it is predicted that developing economies would, would be harder hit um, compared to um, their counterparts in, in, in developed countries. Um, and with 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 economic challenges comes the need for a more frugal lifestyle, 
and um, people are learning to live within their means. People are, le- are learning to 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 not invest and save as much as they can. And a frugal lifestyle means that you cannot afford certain complexities anymore. And um, complex technologies, complex products and services aren't what you know is in you know mainstream thinking right now. Everybody is trying to to be as frugal as possible. So um, when you cannot afford those complexities, it, it's, it's imperative that innovators begin to think, you know, along frugal lines going forward, especially within the next two to three years, within the next two to five years, um, um, sure. basically. And, um, you know, we, we, we look forward to lifting of the lockdown situations globally. We look forward to increased economic activity. We look forward to an opportunity for people to move around and for goods and services to move around. But even at that, there's still a lot of uncertainty in the air and Absolutely. everybody looking towards frugal innovators to drive um, the, the, the next wave. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Class, Ray, we'll come to you. Save the best for last. Class, would you like to go ahead? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sid. And thanks also to Horasis for having me. Um, I'm sitting right now here in uh, Shanghai as you can probably see from the background. And uh, I believe indeed the the opportunities, the digital opportunities that uh, this crisis also gives us. Uh, I mean, Noel spoke about uncertainties and challenges, but also about the upcoming opportunities. Is this very seminar, right, where we have now six um, gentlemen here uh, from the United States, from Europe, from Africa, Nigeria, right, Singapore, India, and China. So we are really joining here from, from such faraway places uh, to discuss, which it would have been very unlikely that we would have met all in New Delhi today, yeah, um, with giving all the travel involved and so on. So there are also opportunities. Um, I'm here because I have been uh, living also in India for more than 12 years. Uh, I've been building up SAP labs there. Um, I'm now heading at SAP globally, our R&D labs across the globe. Um, and therefore, of course, innovation is also what I do every day for, for my living. Um, and the topic itself, I think I would like to bring later in the discussion two aspects. One is certainly what type of frugal innovations do we really see, uh, have seen also during the crisis? I think there are very many interesting examples also away from the digital world, but also, and then on the digital side, what is the learning there, right? Uh, why were some companies much better adjusted? Uh, because they had maybe transparency in the supply chain and the cash flow uh, where the customers are and others not, right? And, and what can we learn from that? Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Ray? Thanks, Sid, and, and thanks to Frank and, and Rasis for in, inviting me um, to the panel. Uh, I'm back again. <laughs> my, my name is Ray Walsh. Uh, I am Assistant Professor of Emerging Technology Standardization at Dublin City University in, in Dublin, in Ireland. Um, there I am a member of, amongst other things, a Science Foundation Ireland funded research centre uh, for global digital content. Um, my technology areas would be uh, quite wide in relation to um, uh, emerging technologies like cloud and big data and IoT and, and uh, most recently artificial intelligence. And I work on international uh, committees for ICT standards, including um, IEEE's uh, European Public Policy Committee, uh, the World Economic Forum for our Digital Leaders, and the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. And I'm picking up on, on um, what Gurvinder said about talent. Um, Suket mentioned uh, change, and, and, and where I see change, I, I look at disruption. And, and, and uh, Noel and, and Klaus just mentioned sort of the frugal life and opportunities associated with that. And, and I see frugality as not necessarily being cheap or substandard. Frugality to me, it means smart. Okay. So if you put smart in front of anything, then uh, you, you can be frugal, but you can be innovative. And in terms of frugal innovation, it's, it's about getting the maximum uh, output for the minimum amount of input. input. So we're optimi- it's an optimization um, you're looking at at problems and come up with optimal solutions. And in relation to this, if you want to create a frugal society, and I say, and I'm calling that a smart society, an innovative society, um, you need to look at 
the untapped potential that already exists um, within uh, the ecosystem, the digital ecosystems. And sure. talent and connectivity are key here. Talent, me, me, which we mentioned earlier and, and Gurvinder mentioned. And that means education and, and training and learning and upskilling, etc. And okay. then infrastructure is the other thing. So we need for, for ICT enabled um, professionals, you need access to 5G, fiber, you know, so good broadband, good connectivity. Sure. And uh, I'll leave it there for the start and just okay. give you an opportunity to get in some more detail on your questions. Okay. Thank you, everybody. I think I think we've set the stage fairly nicely for what should be a great discussion. I think uh, we we there is there is common ground consensus that frugality is not necessarily about costs, but it's about being smart, making making do, or doing the best we can with as little as we can or with what we have. And you know, I think. Now what we can do is discuss various aspects of this. And I'm, I'm sure each of the panelists will bring their own experiences from their, you know, from, from their work, from, from, from their markets to the discussion. And uh, just a couple of, couple of things. We are just going to run a quick poll to see, uh, to see where, where our audience is from, what the, what sectors they are from, rather, the private sector, public sector, just to get a sort of a flavor of uh, of the audience, you know, the breakup of the audience. And I will start that poll now. So I would strongly recommend all audience members to, to please participate. And we have our first question as well. What better way to start the panel with than with our first question? So the first first question is, from Gregory, it's, what are the differences or parallels between frugal and lean innovation? I think this is an interesting question which follows directly from what we've been discussing. And anybody, anybody on the panel that would like to start off with this question, differences between frugal and lean innovation. I'll take a stab, Sid. Sure. Um, We're okay. and then it's okay. Okay. I, uh, uh, Gregory, um, I think frugal is about behavior and lean is uh, more um, more about a specific methodology. Um, it's and uh, they coexist, right? So it's actually interesting you bring it up because it's exactly a question and a topic I was thinking before joining. And uh, I'll be really brief and then give it to Suket. So, sure. in some sense, some of the Modern methodologies of at least of software development, technology development, even even though I come from a deep and long heritage of technology, uh, you know, later on if we have time, I'll, I want to cross pollinate into other innovation in other uh, realms. Um, a, modern methods of technology and software development have been incorporating over the last, um, I would say, you know, uh, decade and a half, agile, iterative lean methods, you know, as a de facto behavior. So it dovetails very well into the environment that we are situated in for. Over to you, Suket. Uh, yeah, I think, Gurbinder, I agree with you. Lean innovation is a method of process, whereas I think frugality is a behavior. Uh, I'm struck by uh, Mahindra and Mahindra's value, which is displayed all over the middle. It says frugality is a mindset. And I was talking to uh, somebody from outside India who'd been to Mahindra and then had come to visit us. He was baffled. He said, How can a company put frugality as a mindset on their, on their values and values? I said, Well, look, this is India. And um, lean innovation works for new product development, but I think innovation should not be pigeonholed or boxed with, uh, within just products. Uh, business processes, customer services, business models, everything can innovate and change. And frugality as a mindset is, I think, far more difficult to build in than, uh, you know, in innovation, I think frugality is harder. Okay. Yeah, I think that's... Yeah, I was following on from what Sikesh is saying. I also said to say that um, frugality like has a much broader scope than lean. Um, frugality it has has connotations associated with sustainability, you know, with, uh, how it affects the how we can in, interact with the environment, 
you know, it's 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 the bright product even of, of the, our remote working, which has become um, um, commonplace now. And and people in the IT sector and, and IT enabled professionals who can use tools and, and software platforms, you know, are in a unique situation to provide more frugal services because from the comfort of their own home, they can operate globally. Um, and this is this is a key aspect of, of looking at you know digital digitalization, the digital economy, you know, digital single markets, data economy, data sharing, data frameworks, etc. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Um, we have the results of our poll. So we are sixty eight percent private sector, twenty six percent from the non profit or third sector, five percent academia, and we do not have participants from the public sector. So that's just it's just a sort of a breakdown, which which may help you know, uh, take our conversation in a certain direction. So with that, I will just end this poll. Uh, the next question, the next part of our discussion is that, you know, we talk about innovation being seen during COVID. And we are already seeing a lot of it happen. It's taking various forms, whether in households or in businesses. And... Class, is this something you'd like to talk about? You know, what what forms of innovation are we already seeing, and how they how may they translate into innovation going forward? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Thank you, thank you, Sid. And indeed, um, I believe because we were just discussing about uh, lean and uh, frugal, yeah, uh, a corporate would usually approach this uh, the topics which are on hand now more in a lean fashion to come with the customer point of view. This is in the end what Lean is about. Um, but having said this, what, what we have observed is that in, in, in many countries at the same time, of course, there was a huge shortage, right? And one also element of, uh, of frugal innovation has always been a uh, scarcity of, of resources. Uh, and therefore, in a situation like this, frugal was really put to test. Yeah? So people have found completely new ways to create whatever, uh, ventilators, right? Low-cost ventilators. Mm -hmm. There are many examples. Uh, I, I know examples from, from East Africa more. I, I'm sure Noel can add for West Africa also, like from Kenya um, and then from Makarere University, uh, where, where really nice things have come out to just help people in need immediately, right? And um, that is something that... <laughs> Also, an opportunity, yeah. And then, if uh, if we move over to the digital part of the world, then we have really seen also a jump digitalization in many areas. Yeah. So, uh, everyone who was still using cash has probably also stopped using cash. <laughs> Meanwhile, because these these ugly banknotes, you just didn't want to touch them anymore. Right? <laughs> so, it is just, um, and it has really happened. Yeah? I mean, many countries where where cash was still. Uh, we have seen that that actually the digital payment systems and all of this has has uh, really jumped forward. Also, digital ordering and delivery services, etc. And on the corporate side, also now many corporates woke up and said, "Oh, I have a this supply chain uh, disruption. Uh, where do I get now these goods? Oh, why don't I have actually a digital marketplace in my corporate ERP system, for example? Right? Why why do I still?" go to the telephone or why I'm dependent here on just one uh, supplier, etc. cetera. Um, and also here we see also, for example, a huge demand now coming of a much deeper digitalization also of the corporate sector. Yep. Cash flow is another example. You, you need to have cash and you need to understand and know what will be my cash situation end of this month, end of the quarter. I mean, many companies will run out mm -hmm. of this just for the sheer lack of cash. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point because because at times of crisis like this, I think learnings from one market into another, what can what has worked in one place, can it be applied to another? I think that's one of one of the key things. And you know, with 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 that theme in mind, I'd like to just bring Noel into the discussion. And you know, are there other examples of such frugal innovation that are being seen in Nigeria, for example? That you know that that could be applicable to other to other developing economies, say India in this case. Yeah. Um, to borrow the words uh, from Theodore Lepit, that um, people don't people don't want quarter inch drills, they want quarter inch holes. And um, <laughs> COVID nineteen has created a scenario where um, there are new jobs to be done now. Um, 
people people are now looking forward to um, doing certain things they didn't think they would be doing so soon. And um, from a Nigerian perspective, I practiced as a medical doctor for a while um, in Nigeria. And um, I can tell you that during my practice, we lacked ventilators. Uh, even before there was any issue about the health crisis um, affecting the entire globe. Um, yeah. During the COVID-19 crisis, when it hit the country, it was obvious to everyone that Nigeria as a whole couldn't boast of over 500 ventilators as a nation of over 200 million people. And um, that, that created a quagmire uh, uh, per se. Um, and um, there was an immediate need for ventilators, um, personal protective equipment, um, you know, a lot of things. Uh, the primary, secondary, and tertiary health institutions were under stress because we had never seen anything like this before. And from what we were seeing all over the globe happening in China, in Italy, in Spain, in Germany, and a lot of all these countries, um, it really scared everybody. So I think this pushed a lot of innovators back into their labs. And we started seeing innovative creations um, bordering on ventilators, um, <laughs> and all that, uh, the Nigerian military led the way and created a ventilator, um, a small size ventilator, not like what the Dyson or the 3Ms or the, or the, or the you know, all these other organizations would create, but it was, it was, it was, it was workable. But yeah. of course, you understand that one of the problems we face, you know, one of the problems frugal innovators face from this part of the world is standardization. And, um, you know, with poor sound standardization mechanisms as well, it's, it's almost impossible to move these innovations into mainstream use. So you see most of these innovations just, you know, languishing in the laps of those who created them um, because either the government agency will not adopt these equipment or the hospitals will not adopt these equipment. So for innovators from here, I mean, really get in you know, the support that they should have got it or the, the quick support, the quick recognition that is needed, you know, to spur more innovative thinking, to spur more co-creation and all that. So, um, yes, we, 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 we saw, um, apart from, from the, from, that's from the health perspective, from the education perspective, schools were locked down. We had millions of, of, of young children at home and um, needing education. And a lot of state governments rose to the occasion and um, digitized education quickly. Um, most of the telecommunications organizations in Nigeria, especially the MTNs of this world, the Airtels and the Globalcoms, came up with educational um, um, products, educational mobile applications that students could use while at home. And um, this has helped a bit. But of course, you know, mobile penetration is not as it is in developed um, you know, economies. So, um, Right now, we don't, we, we don't, we, we can't even track how bad rural education is right now because not, not every part of the country, you know, you know, has that um, um, mobile penetration that would aid digitization, you know, of the education process. Um, okay. Apart from that, we also saw a spike in the use of um, smart logistics services. Um, a lot of logistics companies um, made a lot of money during the COVID 19 um, period, which we are still in. Uh, because they, they found it, you know, quite lucrative moving products, goods and services around because people were in a lockdown situation. So sure. we, we saw innovations there as well. But it was yeah. basically driven by those who had pre-COVID, who already had significant market share. Um, yeah. most, most of the new entrants trying to create products and create services to meet the needs of people during the lockdown didn't really get mileage because sure. one, yes. they didn't really have the trust. They didn't have the money to back up um, whatever they were doing. So we, we saw a bit of all this and uh, sure. we're still seeing it. But like I said, um, standardization, um, recognition is something that frugal innovators from this part of the world still lack. So adoption of their innovators is still a major problem. Yep, I, I think that brings you know that brings into question some of the interesting themes that we were discussing prior to our call, right? One is about that it's not just about frugality, but also about eventually scalability. Two, you know, can can industry help in this regard? You know, can industry help an entrepreneurial frugal sector? Um, another perspective that I'd like to bring in, and 
and pardon me for being so quick on this, but we have only 15 minutes left. So another question that I'd like to bring into this is, uh, you, we, when we talk about frugality, we all, often talk about what's happening in a village, in a society, or at an individual level. But as Suket's mentioned, we don't, we don't somehow seem to talk about it from a business perspective that businesses need frugal innovation and, and tech to help them along too. So these are some of the themes that I'd like to to bring in. And uh, so, Kate, if I could start with you very quickly, you know, frugality matters to businesses. How is that? How are we seeing that? How are we seeing that in your business, for example? And we'll we'll try and keep all of it short because I there's a lot of stuff we need to discuss. I hope we don't cut, get cut off in 15 minutes, but let's start. I think the most important thing this pandemic has shown is the difference between resilience and efficiency. Uh, as businesses were driven by efficiency, but that comes at a cost to res resilience. And all this boils down to is, is, is value for money. Where are we spending money, not wasting it? And I think where um, India needs maximum innovation right now is in the SMEs. SMEs are the engine room for India's growth. And just the Lack of systems within SMEs. SMEs tend to be uh, technocrats, proprietors, running the businesses off them. Uh, they just know their business so well, they're able to run it. But I think where we as industry can help them because they're generally suppliers to larger industries is help them putting in simple systems. It could be an Excel-based MRP. It could be an Excel-based payroll. It doesn't have to be very complex. But if we can help them uh, create frugal systems which improve their resilience, I think that we go a long way towards uh, driving growth across the whole uh, gamut. Okay. Now, following on from that, you know, when we talk about frugality and from a business perspective, one of the key things there is how how can IT help? How can the IT industry help? And I would like to tie that together with with the question of scalability. That can we take what is working with one business or in one particular sector across? to another sector or to another part of the country. Uh, you know, Ray, Gurvinder, love to hear your thoughts on this before we move to the next themes. Yeah, well, we've actually seen this happening already. I mean, the, uh, with, with the use of, for example, 3D printing, okay? Who would have envisaged, for example, that when, when we had this need through COVID-19 for, for um, uh, healthcare-related uh, paraphernalia like like masks and... and, and uh, um, sanitizer that that we have three three D printers creating face masks, you know, um, out, out of and in a lot of instances out of recycled plastic. So it's it's a uh, it's amazing like where these innovations come from from effectively from an IT related um, uh, innovation like but been applied to a different sector like in terms of health healthcare and like where are the next three uh, D printing uh, solutions going to be applied? Like is it going to be in, in relation to uh, agriculture or transport or finance? You know, we've, we've seen other uh, business-related related frugality uh, um, innovations in, in, in sectors where, like, let's say for, for transport, like where we have um, micro-mobility. We have these e-scooters now and we have people using bikes, you know, which has an environmental impact as well as having a business impact in terms of, of low cost. Um, uh, it, we have, uh, in terms of these uh, remote delivery systems, which was mentioned um, previously, we, we can have auto autonomous delivery vehicles now um, delivering for the food sector. Uh, we, we can have you know either drones or, or uh, um, electric vehicles delivering for the food sector, or again for agriculture in terms of produce as well. Many of the frameworks and platforms that are required for for this type of innovation um, require IT and, and programming capability, and that can be provided, as I mentioned earlier, frugally. It's about skill and connectivity, and but it does require financial supports. I mean, it will require um, microfinancing, for example, like you know, for, for to help in delivering ICT innovations to air for other other sec sectors. And innovation is increasing about digitalization uh, of, of, as mentioned earlier, uh, its supply chains and making services more efficient and transparent and simplifying information sharing and know your customer information like through digital platforms. No one mentioned standardization. And standardization is going through a massive accelerated uh, uptake at the moment. It's, it's key for any developed economy, you know, to be to to uh, 
create a foundation in standardization, particularly in our industry, the ICT industry. And in, and, and to follow up from, from what Suket said, like in terms of SMEs, we have this need now in a frugal way to create proof of concepts and prototypes and software. And, and what is the most optimal way of doing that? You know, is to leverage uh, student talent, protect, uh, untapped um, talent that hasn't been used to date to create these new novel uh, micro industry small startups and SMEs uh, where there's there's a new you, you, you sure. take an approach to providing services. I leave okay. it there. Give, give sure. uh, Dr. Govinder a chance. To yeah, I'd like to bring in Gurvinder and then Klaas. Thank you. Um, I'll be. Uh, let me do this. Uh, uh, let me ground the discussion into some examples that come to my mind, yep. and then I'll also do the wrap up from my end and make it easier for uh, for you, Sid. Um, the uh, you know we so everyone's heard of. Uh, I'll make a quick jump over here, but I think you'll understand. Everybody's been hearing about uh, you know vertical farming and how do we get more out of uh, agriculture and you know feeding feeding the world and all that kind of stuff. Um, it has to be any any form of innovation, frugal or otherwise, has to be net. And here's the example. And since I'm based in Dallas, uh, Jersey City recently made an announcement in the wake of pandemic to give free lettuce to its citizens to in the city. Now it turns out that that lettuce is farmed in a vertical farm in 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 the in the urban setting in the urban center. But here's what I mean by net: that innovation has to be net beneficial yes it's a good it's a good cause in terms of new styles of farming and um you know the whole green and sdg um, uh, united nations efforts but mm -hmm. here's the catch the cost of that lettuce was 17 dollars a pound 17 dollars a pound now normally a lettuce would be even if it's organic it would be about five dollars a pound right so we have to pay attention to all dimensions of it so uh, I, I, I'll wrap up with the with the thought that you um, said started around. You touched on scaling. To me, there are three aspects related to scaling. One is that design has you know we have to design and exert influence over new kind of. Um, I'm introducing a new term over here: new kind of social contracts. Any innovation, any transformative situation like a pandemic, or any innovative situation has to reestablish the relationship between governance, capital, talent, and products, right? It has to reestablish that relationship. Uh, there's no time to elaborate, but if you are interested more on social contracts, a lot of work has been done by um, MIT, where I was associated with you know, certain talks and forums at the MIT Media Lab. The second point around scaling is actually what I already made around the lettuce example, and that is the impact of innovation has to be net positive. Yep. And, and then the third one, we've touched, a uh, you know, few of my other distinguished um, uh, panelists have touched the topic of pyramid. And we tend to have a, um, uh, we tend to fall into, we tend to collapse into the thinking that the, that the pyramid bottom is where it is. And we have to, we have to supply that, bottom of the pyramid with innovation. My argument will be we have to raise the floor of that uh, of that pyramid, and that is part of the social contracts, but other things. The, the last point I'll make is around patterns in cross-pollinating from one domain to the other, Sid, as you were, you, were, you, were, you were pointing out. We usually think of innovation in terms of technology because it's a crazy field and you know, I have a lot of scar tissue myself from working in technology for over two decades um, in the last four waves of you know technology disruption. But I will, and I'll put I'll put a link out in the chat in just a moment. But what I would say is that just as open source has brought huge frugal, lean, agile innovation into the software domain, it has also brought now into the hardware domain. We have to use. We have to look at those techniques and apply that into the policy and the process domain, which is where there are a lot of barriers, particularly in India, right? Okay. So the example I'm going to give you, and I'll close with this, and I'm putting it out on the chat for anybody to look at this further. If I, if the chat can go go forward, I don't know. It's not going through. Um, is uh, take a look at policy, something called policy 2.0. It's a Medium article. If you go to Medium, put out by a company called Lemonade. Uh, which is in the U.S. but is going global. It's an insurance company called sure. Lemonade, 
and they've come up with policy 2.0, how complicated for the India market or any market are your insurance policies and how many of us really understand it, right? So basically sure. they put easy English language, not legal language, of what an insurance policy look, should look like, and they put sure. it out in the open source for wide mm -hmm. industry adoption by all okay. insurance providers. So take a look at it. That will give you another example and better reading. Sure. So I have I have a pop up on my screen which says we have four minutes, 15 seconds left. I'd like to bring you in class on something that we would like to discuss um, and put you in a spot to answer a couple of questions. At least one of them, we have a couple that have come in. So the next question I have, I would like to uh, talk about digitalization. We've talked about how in the past about how digitalization can lead to democratization of opportunity. And is it plausible to say that that in itself results in a greater chance for innovation? And I would like to club that with a question which we have from Punita, which asks what innovation is required for managers? And I would like to give you just two minutes. Okay, <clears throat> that's going to be an innovative challenge. <laughs> um, very, and, and thank you for the question also to Sunita. Uh, I believe um, in terms of the, um, yeah, first question, let's start with the first question, right? Uh, how, how do we see that? Um, sorry, I lost my point. Um, the first question? First question was about uh, digitalization resulting in a democratization. Ah, yeah, right. democratization in, indeed. Um, in a way that is true, what we see is that uh, also in this crisis, all of a sudden you include many more people in discussions, also in innovative discussions, also within the company. Previously, there were always some kind of constraints and also people just had to be part of an SAP lab to be able to innovate with us. That has gone away. You can sit anywhere in the world. So in a way, just as a very simple example, indeed, uh, innovation and the digitalization and access uh, really democratizes also innovation and also leads to more innovation. And innovation for managers, of course, that's a, that's a huge um, topic. I believe um, we probably also need to re-innovate ourselves as managers, that if this is the core of the question. Uh, managers need also to acquire new skills. Uh, in, in this new world uh, and also need to really become uh, more agile. Uh, and um, for us, there, there's, there's really a lot to learn at this, at this point in time. And I just leave it, I guess, two minutes. Uh, quickly, we have one more question. I would, before we can end, I would just like to encourage all participants and the audience to please consider this. We have 73 members of the audience. Please consider this as only as an initiation into these topics. I understand we've only touched upon various different aspects of, of frugal innovation, but I think that's the idea, to touch upon these aspects, to get people thinking, and hopefully to keep these conversations going forward. I have one more question from Sandeep, which is, which how do, how do we teach and inculcate innovation and innovative mindset in school students? Anybody would like? Okay, so here. Um, it's just that simple. I think it's critical to teach children of whatever age that change is a necessity and that whatever change they wish to see in the world, they have to be a part of that change. It, there aren't any concepts, there aren't any principles. These are the only two things which I feel that children must learn from a very early age. Thank you. And right. also to say that change is good. You know, changes can be disruptive, um, but it's an opportunity. And, 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 and we see it within the universities all the time that we're innovating in, in new curricula uh, all the time to try and train the next generation of innovators and startups and entrepreneurs. I think, and I think that, um, you know, people are naturally innovative. Students are naturally innovative. Um, what, what needs to be done is to create the enabling environment for them to exhibit their creativity. And, that, and that's where, you know, um, systems, structures, infrastructure now comes in, you know, to birth the kind of innovation that, you know, is inherent in people. Sure. Thank you. Um, I've just received a notification that it is time for this talk to end. I think we can try and abuse the system a little bit 
and we can go go forward continue with this conversation till such time that we have cut off and if we are cut off abruptly all i'd like to say is i'd like to thank all the panelists and i would like to thank the audience for sending in their questions but till the time we are cut off we might as well continue with one more question from gregory what learnings can we take from frugal innovation and change sorry i don't what learnings can we take from frugal in to from frugal innovation to innovate and change the growth driven capitalism paradigm so that's a pretty heavy question anybody who would like to take that on i think it's very relevant for our times when people are questioning the need or the constant desire for more growth i think that is that is some conversations are happening but anybody would like to take that question yeah i don't so, think that they're they're mutually exclusive said i mean you can have um innovation at a global level which is frugal and doesn't necessarily have to be this capital driven you know it been it, it, it they're not they're not mutually exclusive like it, it's it's a case that we can we can come up with optimal solutions and um, because as i said like going back to our earlier point which we've all mentioned in 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 our in our talks is that frugal means smart you know so yeah, i don't think there's uh, any pre um predisposition to being to being smart at that that means you can't be uh, um contributing to a, to a, a capital uh, uh a capital building ecosystem okay. so so we got to leave with some excitement so uh, contending view <laughs> uh so just an alternative view or a slight uh, disagreement so if, i think we're in a third quickly a third era right so world war 2 somebody was touching uh, the government put a lot of money into innovation and there was institutional help in and and safety nets in protecting labor and talent the second revolution the second era was around you know the 80s and the 90s which was the whole shareholder capitalism and everything put up you know came in and more money was coming from capital markets and from corporations um and in in some regard the 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 strong hypothesis that is being accepted now is that that model of stakeholdership is not necessarily very sustainable that's why united nations is looking at sdg we are looking at other models of you know the role of role of talent and uh, you know in and the right incentive alignments and there isn't really a good third model that has been put in place for this current era that we are now being pressured into um but at least the dialogue is there to come up with what the right model mm-hmm. of course capital is not going away don't get me wrong but what i refer to as what the new social contract between you know capital governance uh talent and uh, property meaning intellectual property is going to be I I would like to come in here um yep. that there is there is with with the kind of covid with the kind of situation we face the entire world faced um covid you know intra and post what we're going to face post covid 19 is there's going to be a massive rise of responsible consumerism and um credit suisse did a recent study and um they found out that about 50% of of those who were um interviewed indicated that they would rather buy from you know responsible brands and responsible firms and um 67% of 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 employees um interviewed said they would rather work for responsible firms so firms that are not just focused on growth and 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 capitalism but also have something within the background so with the 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 12th goal of the of the united nations um, sustainable development goals is on responsible production and responsible consumer consumerism or responsible consumption and um any any firm um, post covid 19 that wants to competitively position itself um to to stand out you know among these peers should should have a should have its thoughts in that direction as well you know how how do we how do we expand the responsible consumer base how do we meet the demands the growing demands of this responsible consumer base because I'll, i'll give an example um during the covid-19 pandemic in nigeria something something happened um everybody was on lockdown people needed food people needed supplies and there was an outcry from consumers across the country concerning what brands are actually doing in that regard a particular brand gave funding to the federal government of nigeria and consumers felt they could have gotten those monies directly to them instead of giving it to the government so we're beginning to see you know more and more awakening 
you know, in the minds of people that would now begin to judge brands, not just on their growth potentials and their abilities to put core functional products or services before you, but consumers are now looking forward to which brands go beyond core functional jobs, which brands help us sure. to to achieve emotional and social jobs, you know, and, and, and these are the kind of things that we would see, um, um, you know, within brands competitively um, post-COVID-19. Sure. So, get. Uh, bring you in to close this. So, I, I think look, the, the biggest problem, I would go, they're not mutually exclusive. They're actually, they have to work together. Uh, it's not one or the other, it's both. Milton Friedman was massively misunderstood when he said that companies exist to serve their shareholders. I think he didn't mean to say only their shareholders, but everybody understood it to mean that companies exist to serve only their shareholders. And I think the big change that we were going to see in the 20s, even before COVID, was a more inclusive, uh, whether it was suppliers, employees, uh, community, companies uh, operate in a more uh, inclusive fashion. And I think that discussion has been ongoing. We've now reached a tipping point. And I think all companies are going to change from being value-driven to values-driven. And I think that's going to be a big change that we're going to see in the next 10 years. I think that's, that's, that's room... On that really optimistic note, I think we will draw this session to a close. I, we've, we've discussed a lot of topics. We've discussed some themes. And like we've said, these are only to get us started thinking about these themes. And please feel free to get in touch with any of the panelists should you want to discuss any of these themes in greater detail. I'm quickly checking if we have any other questions. Uh, we don't have any more questions at the moment. And I think we will leave it at that. Thank you so much to all the panelists. We have 77 people in the audience. So thank you all of you for turning in at different times of day, wherever you are. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jason. Take care, Thanks, everybody. everybody. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>